I recently saw this really cool proof on the infinitude of primes, and it comes from the 2003 issue of Math Magazine. It's going to require a couple of definitions though, so let's look at those first. So let's say we've got a set of integers a. What we want to do first is define something called the characteristic function of that set. We'll call it chi sub a, and it'll go from the integers to the set containing 0, 1. And what it'll do is it'll take in an integer n, and it'll give us the number 1 if n is an element of a, and it'll give us the number 0 if n is not an element of a. So it's like a yes-no question. Is this number inside of a, or is it not inside of a? And there's nothing really special with this being a subset of the integers. You just really need some sort of big universal set in order to look at characteristic functions of subsets of that set. But for our purposes, we're going to look at the integers. Next up, we'll say that a set A, which is a subset of the integers, is called periodic if its characteristic function is periodic. Okay, so let's look at some examples. Let's say we've got this set A here and it contains the numbers negative 8, negative 7, negative 5, negative 4, negative 2, negative 1, and then the positives of all those as well, and then the pattern continues. So let's maybe quickly notice that this is everything except for multiples of 3. I think that's pretty clear by what we see here. Now let's look at what the characteristic function does to the integers here, the characteristic function of this set. So negative 6 is not an element, so we'll get 0. Negative 5 and negative 4 are elements, so we'll get 1. Negative 3 is not. Negative 2 and negative 1 are. For 0, we get 0, and that's because 0 is a multiple of 3. And then for 1 and 2, we get 1, because they're elements of the set. For 3, we get 0. 4, 5, get 1. 6, we get 0. So let's observe that this is pretty clearly periodic. It has a period of 3. So in other words, we can say that chi a evaluated at n plus 3k is the same thing as chi a evaluated at n. And this is going to be for all integers n and k. And this number 3 right here is what's giving us a period of 3. Okay, cool. Now, let's look at another example. Let's perhaps say that B is a finite set. Maybe it's the finite set containing 0, 1, and 2. Although, it's really any non-empty finite set. But now observe that this is most definitely not periodic. And we could see that, well, we could make a chart if we wanted to. But let's see, we've got n and chi n of B, or chi B of n. So let's say that goes up to negative 1, and then 0, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That should be far enough. But let's see, if we plug in negative 1, we'll get 0, because that's not an element. 0, 1, and 2 are elements, so we get three ones in a row. And then after that, it's just all zeros. And I guess I should say before that, it's also all zeros. So, like I said, this is pretty clearly not periodic, and that's because if a 1 appears once, it has to appear infinitely many times for it to be periodic. Because we would have to have some sort of, you know, action like this with a, with a period. Um, and if 0 appears at least once, it has to appear infinitely many times as well. No, it doesn't appear infinitely many times in this case, but the 1 does not. Okay, so cool. We've seen an example of a periodic function and a non-periodic function. So now let's prove a couple preparatory results for our main goal. So for our first result, we'll prove that if a and b are periodic, so is the union. And we'll do this by constructing a formula for the characteristic function of the union. So let's see. I claim that the characteristic function of a union b is simply equal to the characteristic function of a plus the characteristic function of b minus the characteristic function of a times the characteristic function of b. Now, how can we check this? Well, I think it's going to break down into a couple of cases. So let's say our first case would be what happens if n is an element of a but not b. 
And I guess I should say that this is in parallel to the case where n is an element of b, but not a. So these two cases will go like very, very similarly. So now let's observe that in this case, or in both of these cases, we have that n is an element of a union b for sure. So if we plug n into this function, we should get the number one. So let's make sure that we do. So chi a union b of n is equal to chi a of n plus chi b of n minus chi a of n times chi b of n. But let's make sure that this right-hand side is doing what we want it to. And in fact, it will be. And we can see that pretty clearly because these first two terms are either of the form one plus zero or zero plus one, because remember, our element n is in one of the sets, but not the other. But that makes the product either one times zero or zero times one. But either way you shake that, you're gonna get the number one in the end. So that means, yes, this right-hand side, at least on elements like this, is behaving like the left-hand side. So now let's check for the other two cases. So our second case will be what happens if n is an element of a intersected with b. But notice a intersected with b is a subset of a union b, so that means that n is an element of a union b too. Which means when we evaluate n, inside of the characteristic function, we should get one. So let's see, n, or sorry, chi a union b evaluated at n. Well, through a very similar calculation to this above, we'll have one plus one minus one. Of course, the zeros are gonna change to ones in this case, because n is an element of both a and b. But of course, that's gonna give us one. So we've got our right-hand side is behaving correctly on elements like this. Okay, cool. But now the last case is n is outside of a union b. But let's observe that that means that n is not in a and n is not an element of b. But now if we do our calculation, chi a union b evaluated in this case, we're just gonna get the calculation zero plus zero minus zero because all of those terms are gonna be zero. In other words, we get zero. So yes, that means this right-hand side satisfies all of the things it needs to satisfy to be this characteristic function. Okay, so now let's use this to show that we in fact have a periodic characteristic function for the union. So thanks for sticking around this long. If you're enjoying the video, make sure to give it a thumbs up. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please consider subscribing. It really helps us out. Okay, so earlier we proved that this characteristic function for the union has the following expression in terms of the what I'll call component characteristic functions. And now we want to show that our union characteristic function is periodic. In fact, there's not much to do here because we know that if you algebraically combine periodic functions, you should get a periodic function. That being said, let's make sure to check that. So let's say that uh, chi a has period a, so it's periodic with period little a, and let's say that chi b is periodic with a period of little b. But now let's look at the following. Let's look at chi of a union b evaluated at n plus k times a b, where here we have n and k are arbitrary integers. But now let's note that by our formula that we uh, showed held, that's gonna be chi a evaluated at n times, I'm gonna write this as kb times a, and then we'll have plus chi b evaluated at n plus, and I'll write this as ka times b. And then we'll also have plus, and I'll just put the product here. I'll let you write those terms out if you need to. But now let's observe that since chi a has a period of a, this first term is simply the same thing as chi a of n. And since chi b has a period of b, this second term is simply chi b evaluated at n. And then the terms in the product go exactly the same way. So we'll get chi a evaluated at n times chi b evaluated at n.
But of course, in the end, that is chi A union B evaluated at N. But see, starting here and ending here shows us that this is periodic. It in fact does not tell us the period. It tells us that the period will divide A times B, but it doesn't tell us that the period is A times B. But it does tell us that it is periodic. But that's what we wanted to do for this claim. Okay, we've got one more preparatory claim, and then we'll prove our main result. Okay, so for our second claim, we'll prove that if A is periodic, then the complement of A, in other words, Z minus A, is also periodic. And this one is actually super fast. There's hardly anything to do. And that is because, let's notice, for all integers in, if we take chi of, let's see, the complement of A, which is Z minus A evaluated at N. Well, that's going to be equal to, let's see, zero if N is an element of A, and then one if N is not an element of A. It's kind of the opposite of the characteristic function. But let's observe that we can rewrite that as one plus chi of A evaluated it in mod 2. So in other words, we just add 1 to whatever chi A of N is, and then we reduce mod 2. But now, notice that if chi A is periodic, then this right-hand side is going to be periodic, which makes this left-hand side periodic as well. So needless to say, the complement of any periodic set is periodic. Okay, cool. Now we're ready for our main result. Okay, so let's recall that what we're trying to do here is show that there are infinitely many primes using this structure of periodic sets. So let's get to it. So this is going to go like a lot of proofs of infinitely many primes, and that's going to be we will work towards a contradiction. So by way of contradiction, let's suppose there are only finitely many primes. Okay, cool. And then after that, what we want to do is build a set out of each prime. So for each prime, we'll call that prime P, let's define the following set. And I'll call the set A sub P. And it's simply all integer multiples of P. So it's everything of the form M times P, where M is an integer. And we would maybe write that as P times Z if we wanted to. So that would be kind of the same way of doing that. But let's notice that these are all periodic. All of these sets are periodic. And I think that's pretty clear because, well, what do you get? You get a bunch of zeros, and then for every pth number, you get a one. So you get a one at zero, you'll get a one at p, 2p, uh, 3p, so on and so forth. So this is periodic with period p, if you will. Okay, good. So now what we want to do is set just normal capital A be the union over all primes P of A sub P. And let's observe that because we are assuming that this is a finite collection of primes, because we're assuming there are finitely many primes, this is in fact a finite union of periodic sets. But let's recall, we proved that the union of two periodic sets is periodic, but then by induction, we could prove pretty easily that a finite union of periodic sets is periodic. So in other words, here we have that A is periodic. Okay, but let's see, what does A contain? Well, notice that A will contain everything except for one and negative one. Now, how do we know that? Well, simply by the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Everything has a prime factorization. So every number other than one and negative one is a multiple of some prime. So it will be in that A sub P. So, well, what does that mean? Well, that means that Z minus A simply contains negative one and one. But then why is that problematic? Well, since A is periodic, we know that Z minus A is also periodic. 
That was our second result. But then by an observation we made earlier, and I didn't prove this carefully, but we definitely waved our hands at it and gave an example. We showed that finite sets were not periodic. So that means that this negative one and one is not periodic. But check it out. We just showed that this Z minus A was simultaneously periodic and not periodic. So that's a pretty clear contradiction, contradicting this assumption we made up here that there are finitely many primes. So that means there can't be finitely many primes. In other words, there are infinitely many primes. And that's a good place to stop.